অরিত্র সাউন্ড কোয়ালিটি দেখো
আমাদের ঠিক আছে আমাদের Shudhapa, he is Radha Taman. Yeah, you can. My new colleague. Yes, hello. Oh. Oh, hello, madam. Hello, hello. Mohadi. Uh, I think you should start now. Here? Yeah, yeah you are in. Talk, madam. Okay. Let's start it. Okay. webinar and i would love to share one data with you uh, for yesterday's webinar 
uh, I'll give you the report of last night uh, for day one of the webinar, the number of views that we found out on YouTube that was more than 1400. So it's, it's really too good to believe and thank you all that you made this possible for us. And I really hope that we would receive the same kind of enthusiasm and active participation and you know the academic interest uh, that you have expressed yesterday we would receive the same today also from all of you with that note we would begin today's uh, today's technical sessions and i'm really proud and delighted to welcome two very eminent academicians uh, who are present here today Dr. Shukhava Shengupto from the Department of History, University of Polani, and Dr. Dilanjola Deb from the Department of English, Jadavpur University. We are so thankful and indebted to both of you. I know that you have worked extensively on this particular area that is life writing, and I'm sure that after uh, we, we come to know about your observations and we listen to your talk, uh, our webinar would attend new heights and new scales altogether. So thank you so much, both of you. Uh, with that note, we would begin our technical session. That is technical session three of our two-day webinar and uh, technical session one for today. Uh, I would uh, introduce uh, Dr. Shukapa Shengupto, who is from the Department of History, Golani University. Uh, she has completed her master's and PhD from Jadavpur University and is now working as an associate professor in history at the University of Kollani. She is now pursuing her research works on the folk religion, culture, and different ethnic communities in India. Ethnomedicine and nature therapy are the areas of her special interest. Her book, Ethnic Nature Cure and its Modern Usage, focuses on the vast knowledge of ethnomedicines forgotten by our modern world, but still in use within exclusive ethnic communities. Her other book, Persecution and Protest, introduces a new approach in the field of conventional study of economic history through highlighting specifically the gender issues related to war and life of the industrial working class in the 20th century colonial Bengal. She has edited several volumes like Navigating Nationalism, Diverse Discourse, and Pondering the Past, Volumes 1 and 2. We would love listening to you, ma'am. So over to you. And her topic for today is Peeping into the Obscure Bowel World, Mimlu Shen's writing in the genre of cultural history. Over to you, Dr. Shruta Pashen. Thank you to the organizers. And my best wishes to all. Good afternoon to all. Today, your broad theme is life writing, historical context, and literary perspective. Under this broad theme of life writing, historical context, and literary perspective, I would like to initiate a discussion on the Baul community, which derived from an actually from an oral religious tradition of rural Bengal. I have chosen a topic based on the writing of Ming Lu Shen. It's actually a memoir of Ming Lu Shen, but the name of the book is The Honey Gatherers. My topic is peeping into the obscure bowel world, Ming Lu Shen's writing in the genre of the cultural history. Now, before going to my main topic, let's take up two main questions. Firstly, what is life writing? What do we mean by life writing? And the second question is, how can we relate life writing with history? Is it history or does it help to reconstruct history in other way? Now, let's start with the first question. What is life writing? Life writing itself is not history, but it contains varieties of personal narrative like autobiography, biography, diary, travelogue, memoir, collection of personal letters, whether one's own or someone others, which, which are considered as important elements of for writing history. A historian does not consider these writings as pure history. 
I'm repeating, these are not pure history to the historians because they lack objectivity and are very often biased, emotional, and exaggerated in nat nature, but its thick description and the multiple approaches of the author of the life writers immensely help to look into different perspectives of history. Now, a question naturally comes, what is the thick description? It's a term used in cultural history. Following Clifford Griggs, we can explain that. Thick description is a person's action and behavior in his context. In that way, a person and his surrounding all come under the purview of the cultural history. Now, we already have seen that life writing is not pure history. Then the question naturally comes in our mind that how does life writing facilitate reconstruction of history? Louis W. Banner explained life writing, uh, the nature of life writing and its connection with history. He says in such writing, individual acts like text and his surrounding as the context. Therefore, his experience, reaction, interaction, and reciprocation with the surrounding bring out the elements of history spontaneously, especially in the realm of cultural and more precisely in the field of oral history where written archival documents are very often missing. Among the life writings, biographies or memoirs illuminate particular cultural events in a particular society within a particular time frame through interviewing associate persons and also accessing private archives like diary, letter or songs. Life writing helps writing histories of class, race, ethnicity, medicine, religion, within the broad spectrum of cultural study. Now, let's come to our main topic. Let's skip into the Baul world. It's a mystic world and we, the laymen, do not know much about them, about this religious sect. Here, I will discuss how the book named The Honey Gatherers by Mim Shen has made a significant breakthrough in the oral obscured world of the Bauls of Bengal. Who are these Bauls? The Bauls are the people who live in the fringes of the rural society of Bengal. They are poor, but their religion contains a very high philosophy. They worship man and wander from place to place with their mellifluous songs. But people belonging to the mainstream of the society have very little idea about these wandering minstrels because their songs carry dual meaning and the secret bowel knowledge is usually transmitted orally from a guru to his disciples. So it is not for the people uh, uh, other than their community. Even their religious rituals, social customs and mode of worship that is based on sexo-yogic pursuit or deho shadhuna, they call it deho shadhuna, we all are strictly kept secret from the rest of the society. When Urmimala Mimlushen, an educated modern girl from an elite affluent urban family, suddenly met a group of such wandering minstrels from Bengal 
in a concert of Paris, she became astonished. She had never met anyone from this community before. Therefore, in her book, she gave a detailed description of their appearance and performance. She narrated, I'm quoting from her book. The concert was like nothing I'd witnessed before. Dressed in saffron robes and patchwork jackets, three bowl singers played the simplest of instruments. The first one carried a one-stringed drone, which you know, uh, called Akhtara. The second strode in Kwakili Akhama, plucking drum slung in a bandolier over his shoulder, while the third came tripping in, jingling a tambourine. Sitting in an open circle on the stage, they first invoked their ancestors. They always believe on their gurus and they start their performance by invoking their gurus. The aged among them started with the prayer, Akhanda Mandalahe Guru Nyash Karo, Amare Kripa Kore Alo Dakhao, Gano Anjano Nayo Nedao. Two singers on each side of him joined in the refrain, Gano Anjano Nayo Nedao. As we can see that, if we see the whole thing from the perspective of cultural history, religious history, then we can find that Mimlu's description gives a vivid idea of their attire, the indigenous instruments they use to people who have very little knowledge regarding this religious sect. She also gave a splendid description of their mystic musical performance, especially that of Kobun Dashbaum, whose charming melodious voice and God-gifted musical talent enthralled the audience in the auditorium. Uh, let's listen to a song by Pabun Dash Baul, uh, then you will also find how melodious he is.
This is a prayer she shared with her readers. In her memoir, Nimlu also revealed some secret rituals of the cult. I cannot resist myself to quote uh, from her book where she shared and her unique experience of the initiation or diksha to the bowel fold at Navashtona Asram by the great bowel preceptor Pori Goshai. She narrated the whole ritualistic event step by step very meticulously in her book. And it's a completely different experience. She wrote, The next morning before I was fully awake, Pabon and I were pulled out of our hut and dragged through a mud trough in the middle of the village square by a gang of giggling, swelling young women. I struggled to break free and realized that we were once again in the middle of a bowl ritual game, mud pesty. We were now part of the fraternity and all those around us were now our guru bhais and guru boys, the brothers and the sisters, they picked through the same fraternity. All of them were the disciples of Hori Goshai and Hori Goshai was going to initiate Pabun and Milo to the bowel fold. Pabun had already surrendered to them because he being a part, already a part of the bowel community, he knew the uh, ritual and was allowing them to cover him with clay. I scrambled up resisting and the women held me down as I was pasted with clay from head to foot. The women now picked us up Changdola, that is by our arms and legs, and carried us to the sun where Hori Goshai and Ma Goshai were sitting on their armchairs under a large multicolored parasol. They seated us lotus style in front of them. A hot sun baked the clay, which sat on us into a body mask. I couldn't see much without my glasses, which were in the heart and I was blinded by the dripping of my eyelids. I could feel the skin of my face and my hands and feet stretching. My sari weighed a ton. We were being transformed into clay statues. A woman served us water from green coconuts and built a screen around us with, a, with old saris tied to bamboo posts. We were doused with buckets of water and sprayed and cleaned. They offered us two simple strips of cotton to change into out of our mud pet clothes. We lay down side by side on a mat. Then. Those women pasted us with neem, herbs, turmeric, and oil from the scalp to the tips of our toes. We were bathed and changed into fresh cotton clothes, and they painted tilak on our forehead with sandalwood paste. They untied the screen finally, and around us there was a surge of human voices lifted in ecstatic incantation. Drums were beaten, bells jingled, and the women ululated. They covered us with garlands of flowers, marigolds, jasmines, and water hyacinths. Some wept with emotion also. Hori Goshai and Ma Goshai came to embrace us. They handed us two strings of tulsi beads, and Pobon tied one around my neck and asked me to do the same for him. Ma Gushai kissed Pobon on his forehead. Hori Goshai grinned and touching me lightly on my head asked, What do people in France eat every day? 
O Mangshu, I replied, meaning this, I was getting really hungry now. He laughed and clapped his palm across my lips. Chuh. Don't let them hear you say that word. The bowels are mainly vegetarians. Look how we are getting information about their custom rituals and their daily habits, food habits, their attire, everything. All these are elements to cultural history. The women now brought us platters full of prasad, cereals, fruit, yogurt, and molasses, which the bowels usually take. Then the crowd disappeared and only the inner circle of disciples remained. Hori Goshai and Ma Goshai now gave us a demonstration of their knowledge of sexo yogic skill, which is very important because that is the bowel mode of pursuit, the bowel mode of worship, which is which we call as Dehu Shadhuna. They were master magicians and their craft of body techniques had been acquired through a lifetime practice. Disciples usually get that uh, lesson from the gurus. Sharing such experience, which is generally kept secret within the community, profoundly help us to know more about the obscure rituals of this mystic sect. Throughout the book, Mimlu gave many fascinating descriptions of a journey into the heart of rural Bengal along the Baal sphere. Not only she collected their mystic songs and shared her experience with the Baals, or revealed the secret rituals related to their sexo-yogic mode of worship, she also gave a touch in their day. While Mimlu first met Bobbin's family at Dugapur, she was coming straight from Paris with Bobbin at that time. She witnessed their struggle and distress. As we approached the colony in a cycle rickshaw, she wrote in Honey Gatherers, we stopped at a level crossing for the passage of a train. A small boy, about six or seven years old, panting out of breath, appeared alongside us. Pobon pulled him up onto the rickshaw. He was Pobon's nephew, Bokul. Wordlessly, Bokul pointed towards the railway line, where two village women, shrouded from head to foot in cotton saris, were being laid away by two massive policemen shouting curses and showered blows on the women with their lattes. Suddenly, Mukul, another nephew of Pobun, came running from behind us. He had a bulging jute sack in his hands. Through a tear in the sack gleamed jet black chunks of coal. Bobon's eldest brother, Omullo, winked at me conspiratorially and turned to Mukul. Raja Chile Koilawala, he declared ruefully, and Minglu felt that this was normal practice in this part of the world. Begging and stealing were a way of their life here. However, a huge amount of valuable information about the Baal sect are scattered throughout the book which contributes to an in-depth study on the Baal community in the Journal of Cultural History. Means Minglu also has collected many Baal songs, spirit, uh, which were which are related to the Baal spiritual philosophy and their mode of worship. Let's finish with a Baal song from Minglu's collection, which upholds a Baal's eternal inward search for his Munir Manush, that is the Supreme Soul. I'm playing the song for you. This is taken from YouTube. It is sung by Tulika.
you. Here ends my discussion. Thanks to all. Thank you so much, Dr. Shenbukto. Uh, every time we listen to Baul song, you know, there's a kind of a serenity, peace, and solace that we attain from that kind of song. And, you know, there's so much of profound philosophy associated and embedded uh, in this kind of songs. Uh, so thank you so much for letting us speak into that obscure world, obscure Baul world. Thank you. We will take questions together after both the sessions are over. So now we will move on to our next session. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Joshi has written that excellent. Uh, he has commented. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you yes. Yes, uh, thank Bo you, sir, for your Bohadi, okay, Bohadi. Yes. Professor Joshi has raised a question. It's in the chat box of the meet. Yes, yes, I know. This is, uh, no, he has, he has uh, uh, commented. We will take everything together after okay. the session. Okay, okay. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, so we would move on to the next session. That is our last technical session for today. Um, uh, it's my proud privilege uh, to invite Dr. Nilanjana Dev, uh, Associate Professor of English at Dalit University to deliver her lecture. Um, she was a recipient of the Shastri Indo-Canadian Fellowship twice and Indo-Australian Fellowship. Her fields of specialization include post-colonial literatures, cultures of protest and diaspora studies and Aboriginal literatures. She was a core group member of international collaborations of the Department of English, Jadavpur University, such as envisioning the Indian city and commodities and culture in the colonial world with the University of Liverpool and King's College London, respectively. She led the human ecology team at Jadavpur University under the Indo-EU collaboration project Equal. She recently completed a British Library funded project on digitizing the endangered archives of the British India Association. She has been engaged in several projects on labor migration to the colonial port of Calcutta, 1840 to 1947. She is presently co-investigator in the Rusha II project at Jadavpur University on bodies of difference, which reaches out to urban, peri-urban, and rural schools to develop pedagogical tools and resources to sensitize teachers as well as students on how to deal with bullying on grounds of gender, caste, sexuality, ethnicity, disability, and other forms of difference. We are so honored that you are here with us, ma'am. Dr. Dilanjuna Dev, uh, her topic for today is Aboriginal Lives Matter, Life Writing as Testimony in Black Australia. Over to you, ma'am, and I would request you to put on the headphone, please. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, am, I, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, De Rosio Memorial College for inviting me to speak on a subject that is very close to my heart. Um, in the past few weeks, we have seen protests happening all over the world uh, around the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, but a lot of people don't know that when we use the word black in Australia, it usually refers to the Aboriginal population. And um, the Aboriginal people of Australia have been dealing with systemic racism for more than two centuries now. Um, it is important then, I think, as we try to create global solidarities uh, in this difficult time to reiterate that yes, black lives do matter, but also in India, Dalit lives matter, Adivasi lives matter, minority lives matter, the lives of migrant worker uh, workers matter. So uh, having said this, uh, in, in order to really connect what I'm saying to the time in which we live, I would like to uh, clarify that I will not be covering Aboriginal life writing from all over Australia. You must realize that there are several hundreds of Aboriginal nations across the continent of Australia. And each of them have in the last um, hundred years or so produced 
uh, a fair amount of writing, orature, uh, and it isn't possible to cover all of that. So I will be looking at one portion of Australia, that is the southwestern corner of the continent, if you mentally, mentally visualize the map, that would be the area around Perth on the southwestern coast. Um, just to also drive home the point that, you know, when we use words like Aboriginal or Adivasi, we are often eliding uh, differences that exist within, uh, you know, the communities that uh, come under the rubric of these terms. So, you know, just like there are Sautali, Mundari, Oraun, uh, and other communities that come within, uh, as it were, the word Adivasi in India. Similarly, there are more than, you know, several hundreds. At the time of your contact with uh, European invaders, there were more than 400 Aboriginal nations uh, in, in uh, Australia. So having said that, uh, uh, I'm looking at the community, the Aboriginal community uh, known as the Nyungar. The Nyungar uh, are recognized as a distinct nation or, well, if you want to use that term, ethnic group by other uh, uh, Aboriginal communities in Western Australia, uh, such as the Wangi or the Yamaji or the Miriwu. Um, and they are distinct because of the fact that they have a common ideology, uh, law, a common epistemology about how their land came to be what it is, uh, the work of their ancestral creator figure, the wow girl or the rainbow serpent uh, that created all the landforms of southwestern Australia as it moved through the landscape. Uh, so we must understand then that both in terms of identity as well as, uh, you know, uh, the, the spirituality of the community, land is central. So, you know, when we're looking even at life narratives, it's important to acknowledge that within those life narratives, there is a certain desire to convey a continuing relationship with the land, a continuing relationship with the ecology that goes back many generations, many centuries. Uh, so when my paper is, uh, when I title my paper, Life Writing as Testimony, there is you know, another angle, not just in terms of giving testimony uh, about, you know, uh, experiences of racism through, you know, social realist modes of writing. It is also about testimony in the very real sense of legal testimony in a court of law. Because you must realize that like in India, uh, in Australia, for much longer in fact than in India, uh, Aboriginal communities have been fighting court cases for native title claiming uh, their prior right to land and natural resources, especially where their traditional territories are being sought to be exploited by uh, corporations, mining corporations, gas exploration corporations, and so on. So uh, one of the things that has happened is that Australian courts of law do now do accept uh, these appeals from Aboriginal communities, but these communities must prove their continuing relationship with the land. So if that continuing relationship with the land is, is to be proved, how do you prove that? These are communities that are oral communities. They don't have written documents, uh, you know, histories of the people and so on visual documentation uh, much and so it's important that the stories of the people the narratives of the people also be recounted so you will find a very interesting uh, admixture of you know the the traditional stories the myths of the people as well as the personal familial histories of 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 the people coming together in many of these uh, life narratives. Uh, one of the things I also want to bring out is the very different kinds of uh, life writing that can exist within a single community. And I'll discuss some examples with you as I take you through this uh, discussion uh, of how 
through life writing testimony in the sense of talking about their life experience but testimony in the sense of proving their continuing historical relationship with the land in that process um, many of these authors are in fact uh, those who haven't been to college or are not able to write books on their own so the whole question of mediation then comes in which is that uh, very often their younger relatives uh, write on their behalf listen to their stories and transcribe them so we can have as told as told to narratives uh, not directly written by the aboriginal person but by one of their relatives or someone that they have themselves chosen as the transcriber let's look at the example of uh, one such biography by the aboriginal researcher Stephen Kinnan it's uh, called shadow lines it's not the shadow lines by amitabh ghosh this is shadow space lines uh, which is the story of his grandmother jessie argyle who was taken away from her family at the age of 5 uh, she went against the norm of her time uh, fell in love with and married a white man and the couple was ostracized uh, because of their interracial marriage but they held firm to their belief uh, in, in humanity and their home became the center for aboriginal cultural and social life for about 30 years. Stephen is their grandson and uh, he traces the story of his grandmother very interestingly Remember that his grandmother has only oral memories, but he needs to, as a researcher, substantiate that with facts and figures about, about her life. Where will he get these from? Uh, so one of the interesting thing is, as the ad colonial administration moved from uh, the initial phase of contact through the early years of very brutal genocide into a kind of paternalistic administration of Aboriginal people where they were treated like children, every aspect of their lives were controlled. They maintained meticulous documentation about these Aboriginal people whose lives they controlled. Uh, so he says how he, his, he looked up the government file on his grandmother who had been uh, taken away by the state from her family and the file was as thick as a telephone book but he says that these are double-edged I quote if they did not exist then I would not have access to this information that has helped me to piece together my grandmother's story uh, now what is interesting is that you know you will say that after all she was taken away from her traditional land her family at the age of five how through such displaced, dispossessed people's stories do we prove a continuing relationship with the land? Uh, and here, this is uh, fascinating, she was taken away to a missionary school, the Swan Mission, where, um, it's quite interesting, the teachers tried to make them forget their mother tongue, uh, and yet, and I quote here, where you came from and who your people were became especially important to children taken thousands of miles from their homes. In your own country, rules of belonging were clearly defined. But with the disruption of this, the children held all the more defiantly to their sense of country, whether you were from the north, whether you were from the south, you were a nor'wester, south'wester. Uh, so as the wish missionaries worked to wipe away any sense of skin from the children's minds, it became even more important for these children to know where you were from and who else was from your region. So that sense of belonging never really goes away in spite of this extreme deterritorialization. The missionaries try to replace this uh, with a sense of belonging to the church. And yet, uh, whenever on Sunday afternoons these children got a chance to take a break from all the hard work and church going, uh, they would head into the bush and uh, they loved this chance to go out. Uh, they would hunt and cook food and hot ash and scout the country in the traditional way of their ancestors. So you see, knowledge transmission does continue. Uh, there are ways in which that connection to country remains. 
so you know it's it's important also to note that this story of uh, his grandmother uh, is is something that he tries to show uh, aboriginal people not just as victims but also as people who fight back who resist uh, just as his grandmother and his white grandfather did uh, Another very interesting autobiography, uh, and this is a different, slightly different format, where Glennie's Ward, who is also a Nyungar uh, writer, uh, writes two books, Unayu Fulas and Wandering Girl. And both of these are basically fictionalized autobiographies. They are, in a sense, her memories of her life as a child, again, taken away from her family at the age of five to a mission school. Um, in fact, her teacher once tells her, you Aboriginal people have no future. You should go back to the camps. You will end up in the camps. And she innocently asks, what are these camps? She doesn't know that these camps are the reserves and settlements where her family and other Aboriginal people uh, you know, originally lived and from which she had actually been taken away. And th these are the children who are known as the stolen generation. Uh, so, in in Wandering Girl and Onayu Falas, she also gives a very interesting, uh, I think, historical perspective, which is that many of these black girls, um, they were removed to missions or settlements, but they were never tr given any training for uh, work beyond menial service, for example, as cooks or domestic helps. And they would be uh, not at because of their own wish, but because of the government's close control over Aboriginal lives, allotted to work in white households, where they often face physical uh, uh, abuse, sexual abuse from the white owners, uh, but they had no scope of complaining. You see, because if they complained, they would be sent back to the missions, and the little freedom they had started to enjoy as working women would also be lost. So these are facts that we come to know about as we, um, you know, read Glennie's words novels. And uh, even though she creates this protagonist called Spratty, it is very clear that this is actually her own life that she is talking about, the sheer amount of detail that, that goes into this. Um, it's important, of course, to note that um, not all the children suffered as much cultural deterritorialization as Glennie's ward, who had absolutely no memory of her own family, her father, her mother. Uh, the sense of a persisting identity, even in these boarding schools, mission schools, is something that another West Australian Aboriginal writer, Alice Nanak, writes about. Uh, Alice Nanak, and this is, uh, I'm talking about the mediation that goes into these uh, uh, forms of life writing, so that you understand the complexities uh, of the life writing genre. So Alice Nanak collaborated with Stephen Kinnan and Lauren Marsh uh, on writing her book called When the Pelican Laughed. But unlike Shadow Lines, in which it is Stephen Kinnan who is telling his grandmother's story, here Alice Nanak has greater control in that it is Alice Nanak's voice, her colloquialisms that are coming through, sorry, in terms of her voice. So she has a clear memory of her childhood, you know, growing up with all her cousins in the bush, uh, her family working at the local uh, station, until uh, her mother is tricked into allowing a white family to take her south to he to be uh, educated at the Moor River settlement. And this is this is very tragic. A lot of Black families were told that, you know, there's no future for your children. Let us take them to the mission schools, etc. And at least they will get a good education, have a better future. But the fact is, and all of these biographies and autobiographies show us that uh, they ended up either as domestic helpers or as, in the case of the boys, as laborers or farm workers. No greater uh, quality of vocational education was given to them. They were basically cheap labor, deliberately underdeveloped, deliberately undereducated. 
So Glennie's, uh, like Glennie's ward, uh, Alice Nanook also works on as a servant on farms uh, in the homes of white people. But uh, again, another story of resistance. She's able to escape from the home of her employer and eventually marries her uh, Aboriginal boyfriend and raises a large family. Uh, and her life, you know, the, this marginal life, living in shanties, slums, reserves, camps, uh, constantly experiencing both casual racism as well as official racism. That is something that she talks about in great detail. But as I said, in Alice Nanup's writing as well, the constant, you know, uh, resurgence of traditional stories, the myths and uh, uh, sort of, you know, the legends of the people, uh, the, the need to reconnect with the land uh, through the stories of the elders that comes through very, very strongly. Uh, so it's, it's something that we need to understand that it's not just about the land. When you are displaced from your family, sometimes the mission itself where you grow up, the orphanage where you grow up, or the Moor River settlement, which is sort of like a concentration camp for Aboriginal people, uh, that itself for many people becomes the only home they know. So institutions such as places of incarceration, in fact, often feature a lot as the spatial location of uh, these uh, examples of life writing. Another thing to be remembered is that uh, a lot of oral histories need to be also explored as life writing. I know that it seems contradictory, oral history, life writing. But there is this process of translation, in a sense you might say, generic translation between the oral and the written that makes it possible for the stories, life stories of many Aboriginal elders to be rendered uh, into print uh, so that the next generation of Aboriginal people can read these stories of, of their uh, earlier generations. And that's important. It's not so important for us as researchers or for anthropologists and historians to read these. It's important that these stories be brought into print so that the next generation of Aboriginal people are able to access the stories and not lose them. It's a, it's a part of cultural re-education, re-territorialization, you might say, through textuality. Uh, so, but remember that oral histories don't necessarily just have to be about traditional stories, myths and legends that talk about the uh, deep spiritual relationship with the land. Very often these oral histories also chronicle discontinuities testifying to the impact of racism and colonialism on people's lives. One very good example of this would be Numa writer Rosemary Vandenberg's book called No Options, No Choice, in which she, as a university-educated researcher, Aboriginal researcher, transcribes her own father's oral history, his storytelling about his own lives. Uh, now, her father, Thomas Corbett, was deeply alienated from his own Aboriginal culture because he was part of the stolen generation. Uh, he records many of the atrocities he witnessed at, uh, you know, the Moor River settlement, which I said was sort of like a concentration camp for Aboriginal people, including the brutal tarring and feathering of an inmate there. However, like Alice Nana Corbett too, writes of many instances where residents continue to practice their traditional culture even in the settlement or even tried to sometimes successfully escape from the settlement. Uh, he gives the example of an entire group of about 80 Aboriginal people from the Wongi community simply disappearing. The elders had come to stay close to the children who had been stolen from them. And suddenly one night with their children, they just escaped. No matter how much the authorities searched for them, this huge group of people just could not be found. Their intimate knowledge of the countryside, of the bush, helped the large group to escape detection avoiding human habit habitation, living off the land in the densest bushland, 
um, places which the authorities had no idea people could survive in. So you see, uh, you know, this relationship with the land is something that is also that also has uh, an important function in resistance itself to resist colonization, to resist control, to take back autonomy, as it were. Uh, now, but what is interesting is that Thomas Corbett in in the oral history which his daughter transcribes in No Options, No Choice says that, you know, as a child he did not know the names and uses of most of the flora and fauna uh, of the area to which he was taken as a child, as a stolen generation child. And it's only when he was middle-aged, uh, in his 40s, that he learned how to become an Aboriginal again. He relearned all the bush skills that he had only begun to be taught when he had been stolen as a child from his home in Pilbara. So this con conscious re-education that he's talking about, that he himself had to undergo, uh, it, it involves a proper reintroduction to the ways of the land, the traditional uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, ways of nurturing the land, of, of relating to the land. Um, and remember that I'm not only talking about Aboriginal people from southwestern Australia. The Moore River settlement was a place where people from other parts of Australia, particularly western Australia, were often placed. So these were people from other uh, Aboriginal communities who were being brought onto traditional territories which were not theirs, right? So it involved a re-education uh, in terms of how the local Nyungar people relate to the land. So both for Alice Nanup and for um, Stephen Kinane's grandmother, it, it's important to relearn the land from the local tribe's perspective. I hesitate to use the word tribe because of the uh, very colonial uh, connotations of it, of course. Uh, my last example uh, is of collaborative storytelling. And this, this too is very interesting. Uh, uh, Kim Scott, many of you probably know as an eminent Aboriginal, he's part Aboriginal, part European uh, novelist. But many people from the Aboriginal community came up to him and said that, look, you're writing novels for white people. All right, uh, lots of difficult words and fancy images, but write something that is for us, for our community. And that was really something that struck Kim Scott, and he collaborated with his aunt, uh, Hazel Brown, uh, who is a traditional Aboriginal woman, very closely linked with, uh, you know, the Nyungar uh, culture collaborated with her on a book called Kayang and Me. Kayang means aunt. So Kayang, Hazel Brown, and Kim Scott become the co-authors, the collaborators in this uh, story of, uh, in a sense, growing up and relearning the ways of the country, the ways of the land. So, uh, you know, his earlier books were fictionalized accounts of him discovering Kim Scott didn't even know that he was Aboriginal for a long time. So earlier books like True Country actually are fictionalized accounts of his rediscovering his Aboriginal identity. But Kayam and me is different. Uh, he's being taken around the land and told the stories of the land by his aunt, but from an indigenous perspective. And let me quote here, it's a beautiful quote. When I was younger, and this is him talking about how he's feeling when his aunt is reintroducing the country to him from an indigenous perspective. When I was younger, I never knew of such places, such stories. But with Auntie Hazel, I followed ancient footprints and knelt to drink from water holes, felt my palms settle in smooth hollows in granite where many, many hands had once rested. It was as if I was being reshaped from the inside out, standing alone and formless within smoke. I heard voices calling from all around me. So one of the things that Kim Scott mentions, and I think it's important, is particularly in the case of indigenous or Adivasi or tribal life stories, uh, it's not just about proving connection to the land, showing that the culture survives, 
It's also about resisting conventional capitalist notions of development. So the ongoing damage being done to many Aboriginal sites, sacred sites in fact, by mining companies, by the state and corporate uh, powers, is the reason why Aboriginal people need to make their voices heard even more through live writing. And I quote from Kim Scott here, when you, I, we, don't know who we are these days, why try to tell others this, or that something has gone wrong and the world is not quite right? Because otherwise, we will have to listen to them, be silent, watch their visions, and feel our earth vibrate as they hammer it with thick ankles and well-shod feet and their probe and their jackhammer drill. The signs of development, so-called development on tribal land. So it's important, uh, I think, to understand that life writing, Aboriginal life writing, has both the function of documentation, but also a very contemporary, very topical, political function as well in resisting the ways in which so-called uh, sort of capitalist modernity is ravaging their land and destroying their lives alongside the older forces of racism um, and colonialism. Uh, so from uh, it, it's not that early Aboriginal writers didn't understand the importance. Uh, it's not that early Aboriginal, uh, let me not use the word writers, Aboriginal people, even early years after post-contact, did understand that their stories need to be written down. Uh, this is long before, uh, you know, Aboriginal people uh, started being sent to school. Um, a very small number of Aboriginal people managed to make it through a highly racist education system into universities. Long before that, their ancestors realized this and would often reach out to anthropologists, journalists, to tell them to take their stories down. In other words, there's already this tradition that testimony must be given, their stories must be recorded. Uh, even though I think Aboriginal people know more than anybody else about the dangers of mediation, where white editors, white publishers uh, will very often, that's it, whitewash uh, Aboriginal stories. Uh, Aboriginal English is sanitized into a kind of you know, white middle class uh, Euro-Australian English. Um, you know, all of these factors mean that the voice that is coming through is often a voice that's mediated and distorted. But nevertheless, even that allows certain traces, right, of stories, uh, you know, to, to come through. Remember that there are very few Aboriginal-owned publishing houses, uh, very few publishing houses in which Aboriginal people have control over the editing and publishing process. And therefore, you know, whenever we read these stories, it's important to see who is collaborating with Aboriginal people. If they're writing it themselves, then who is editing it? If they're collaborating with someone who's tra transcribing their oral history, then who is that person? You know, what is the kind of mediation and the politics of mediation that goes into these histories that will, uh, you know, uh, cause these stories, as it were, to not reach us as they were intended to reach us, or perhaps reach us in a form that seems more, um, shall we say, palatable to middle class white readers or middle class global readers, but not necessarily the way in which the person had originally expressed or told their stories. So um, it's, I'd like to conclude with a little story here which uh, drives home the point that I'm trying to make, which is that you know, sometimes when there are very few official narratives from the Aboriginal perspective, then you know, creative writing, life writing, the role of memory and imagination becomes important uh, to intervene uh, so that 
you know, through storytelling, through a kind of informal, familial history, oral history, um, state-sanctioned attempts to regulate the narrative of the nation-state uh, can, as it were, be bypassed. Uh, so it's important then that uh, you know this literary historical project of life writing refashions imperial history, colonial history itself. In the process, reordering the master narratives of Euro-Australian uh, history. However, the narratives of Aboriginal communities do much more than merely bolster the community's political and cultural resistance. They are, as it were, the record of the survival of the community's law, history, and pedagogical practices, how to teach the next generation. And above all, the point with which I had begun, they are the justification for the people's claim to their land, their prior claim to the land. In Kaivam and Me, um, there is this wonderful episode where Auntie Hazel Brown has taken out uh, all the family, younger family members, including Kim Scott, on an outdoor excursion. And she points to a little rock and tells the story of a little man, sort of like a, a, a dwarf, a wudadji, who sat down to wait for his family in the wrong place. And this place belonged to a Nyungar woman, and she crept up behind him and hit him on the head. So when Kayang Hazel's little grandson asks her how she knew that this event occurred at the location, <coughs> Kayang sweeps some sand away from over the rock and uh, lo and behold, on that rock are the perfect footprints of the Wudaji, the little man, imprinted in the rock as well as the footprints in the rock of a woman perfectly poised on tiptoe behind the Wudaji. These are actually in the rock, inscribed in the rock. So Kayang Hazel then um, tells her grandson to not tell anybody, to remember this story, but not tell anybody outside of the Nyungar community about the presence of this site. Uh, and remember that most Nyungar since contact have been very unwilling to divulge the sacredness, the si significance of the land that was being taken away from them. They kept it a closely guarded secret, all these places where, in a sense, the land itself tells stories. So we as readers, when we read Kayang Hazel's story being transmitted to her grandchild, we are privileged. At least we're getting to hear about the story. But you and I will never know that actual place in southwestern Australia where that rock is located, where she is telling her story. So the point of the life narrative then in the case of Aboriginal communities is also a reminder for us non-Aboriginal people to know when to back off. In other words, they demarcate a zone beyond which the non-Aboriginal reader or researcher must not and cannot enter in the search for locating historical and cultural context. Thank you. Thank you so much for such an insightful and intense talk. You know, I have listened to you so many times and every time it is the same emotion that is evoked, I am mesmerized. Every time it's so, and I'm sure all the participants out there is the same feeling for all of them. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dev. Now, uh, we would take the questions. Since there are eight fifty registered participants, so uh, we have, you know, created several WhatsApp groups, and the questions will be coming in from there, and the, the teachers of our department will act as interfaces between the participants and the resource persons because it's not possible for going into one-to-one -one, uh, interaction. <coughs> so I would ask uh, the teacher of our department to get ready with the questions. Yes, Obi? Uh, I have a question for Professor Deb, if you allow yes, me. Perfect. Okay. Okay, this is Obi, our librarian and our technical coordinator for this entire webinar. 
First of all, congratulations, ma'am, for such a very wonderful presentation. I'm really enriched. Actually, I was doing some technical jobs, but your speech attracted me to the content that you are delivering. It was fantastic. Actually, ma'am, you have said in your speech that to keep themselves from abolition, Aboriginal people should sound more heard or should create some budge through their life writing. I think government has a very important role to do such kind of thing for such people. So my first question is, what is exactly government's role in it as you think so? And number two is, would you please give us some example of the countries where government is doing really some serious jobs regarding this kind of, uh, as I said, that this kind of activities? Yes. Um... You see, the government's initial role was, as my talk must have made clear, to simply control these people to uh, really uh, take away their autonomy completely in terms of their right to education, their right to choice of livelihood and so on. Uh, but in recent years, uh, as late as 1969, citizenship rights were granted to Aboriginal people in Australia. Imagine before that, an advanced uh, second world nation like Australia didn't even grant them citizenship. So once citizenship rights were granted, um, things marginally improved. I, do, I wouldn't say that socioeconomically much improvement has happened in their lives. In fact, uh, Australia has constantly alternated between labor governments and right wing governments. And each time a right wing government comes to power, Whatever, uh, you know, financial support is, uh, you know, sort of planned for Aboriginal communities, that is reduced. That is the first thing to go uh, in terms of, you know, economic planning. Um, but yes, over the years, uh, there has been a small amount of support in creating what are called ALCs, uh, la Aboriginal Language Centres, okay. where, uh, you know, textbooks, primers, storybooks for children, in the mother tongues, there are, as I said, several hundred mother tongues of Aboriginal people in Australia. So uh, even though these are very low budget operations, but many ALCs have come up in rural uh, or remote communities. Uh, but really, I mean, the number of Aboriginal people in the education system, particularly at the level of tertiary education, leaves much to be desired. Uh, the small number who are there are working brilliantly as artists, as writers and so on. So there's hope for the future. One country right next to Australia that has actually done a lot is New Zealand. I mean, today, I, I think we in the rest of the world are very envious of the fact that New Zealand's progressive policies have made it a COVID-free nation as well. Yeah. But New Zealand has um, constantly uh, supported the way in which you know, Maori language, the language of the indigenous people of New Zealand, uh, it was almost completely forgotten. There were very few people who could actually speak Maori. But from that, they created what are called language nests, where children and their parents would come in on Sundays to relearn their mother tongue. It was a very successful model, uh, which many countries are now trying to uh, sort of, you know, adapt uh, for, uh, you know, reviving uh, tribal languages in their own countries. Yes, the government needs to do a lot, but as Professor Ganesh Devi, who started the Tribal Academy at Tejgar, will uh, repeatedly say, I mean, he's the person who did the People's Linguistic Survey of India as well. There are so many tribal languages, languages which have no script, oral languages, which are on the point of extinction, hundreds of such languages. And really, I mean, no investment is being made to document or preserve or promote these. So much, much needs to be done and very little is actually being done. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, our WhatsApp groups are literally flooded with questions, literally flooded with questions. So uh, I would request Oritro uh, to come to, uh, you know, put the questions from the first group. Uh, the very first question is for uh, Professor Shutoka Shengupto. I will just convey the question. Uh, does life writing of marginalized communities like Dalit contribute to literary aesthetics? If yes, what are those aesthetic qualities of these types of writings? 
the question is from Jay Kumar. Uh, he is a research scholar at Delhi University. And I, uh, ma'am, will I continue with the next question, which is for uh, Professor Dave? Yes, yes. yes, yes. I, I, think, I think let Chutapati answer and then you present yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, first of all, one thing I should make clear that uh, Bausana Dalits, first, they are a religious sect and, it, and they are different. Uh, however, uh, the question, uh, 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 yes, to some extent, uh, it contributes because uh, if they rise spontaneously, actually, uh, what we think, we have a uh, framework. We uh, work within the framework of history. And uh, we have to follow that order and discipline. So, if a, right, uh, a Dalit writes, then it must contribute to cultural history. His literary work must contribute to cultural history to some extent and uh, we have to be, uh, and to make it a part of authentic history, we have to compare it with the other sources and its surroundings. In this way, it can contribute. His literary work can contribute. Oritro, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Oritro, can you please come up with this question? There are, there are lots of questions for uh, Professor Elanjana there. I am just selecting the first few. Uh, uh, the question is, is it compulsory to have land as a central, the central is being quoted, as you have mentioned in your lecture, in the perspectives of life writings? The question is from Orikit Model, PhD scholar, Department of English, Cornish and University. Okay, um, very good question. Um, first of all, I think the relationship to the land is very central to uh, Aboriginal politics everywhere in the world, you see, because um, the primary experience after contact has been dispossession from land, even in the case of Native Americans, you know, the long trail of tears where so many tribes were re relocated to Oklahoma and the United States. Uh, in India also, if you think of, uh, you know, the way in which uh, a lot of uh, Santal and other communities had to be, uh, had to really fight not just against the British, but also, you know, Bengali zamindars and landowners who were trying, the Dikus who were trying to take away their land. So dispossession has been something that makes land so important to keep at the center of, of all discussion. But yes, I take your point that land because there are so many people who've already been dispossessed um, you know they can't as it were throw the colonizer out they cannot le uh, in many cases legally or physically reclaim their land in which case uh, i think it's important then to also talk about labor you know the ways in which uh, certainly there is a continuing cultural relationship with the land even when you are displaced to a new territory or a new settlement, relocated forcibly, whatever the case may be, you develop a new intense relationship with the land because of your primary ethic. Uh, your primary ethic is that you do not own the land, the land owns you. And through this deep connection with the land, wherever you have been dispossessed, you learn, as it were, to love and uh, nurture that new territory, that new land to which you have been relocated. I think that's important for us to understand. But uh, in terms of, yes, dispossession, we might even uh, use the word diaspora, that there are a lot of post-contact uh, diasporas of indigenous peoples around the world removed from their territories. But as you very well know that even in diaspora, the notion of home, the notion of culture, the notion of belonging does survive, even though it adapts in new and strange ways. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Oritra, 
I think we will take other questions after we go for the first round from all the groups. All right. So I would request Ria. Uh, okay, Ria, are you there? Yes, yes. Ria, questions please from your group. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so I have this question for Shutabana. Uh, yes. uh, first of all, I would like to uh, convey that uh, it was such a wonderful session. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for enlightening us. Uh, and uh, okay, now I go for move forward with my question. Uh, so uh, the question is from uh, Dr. Loka Pulga Dash, and she is an associate professor in English at uh, Acharya Prafulla Chandra College, Kolkata. And she asks to please clarify what exactly is meant by purity of history. And uh, she has written purity, purity of uh, history within quotes. Okay. Uh, I have already uh, mentioned it in my lecture that when uh, in life writing, uh, it, uh, life writing very often lacks objectivity. It is biased or exaggerated or uh, very often it reflects the view of the author. So, uh, you know, history needs objectivity. History should be unbiased. It should only put forward the facts. So, life writing cannot be pure history. We can take elements from life writing and we can compare it to the uh, with surrounding uh, other data if possible with archival materials and then again i'm repeating history is a discipline we have to uh, go through that framework of history so uh, we have we have to compare all the uh, material we gather and then we can reconstruct the history so only the written document of a person cannot be pure history. Pure history needs neutrality, objectivity. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, Nilanjana ma'am, it was uh, such a uh, such an enlightening uh, session. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, my question is from uh, Dr. Shubhana Bhattacharya from Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, Pune. She asks, how are life narratives different in oral forms and written forms? Um, here I, I talked about, thank you for the question, it's an important question. Uh, I think that uh, I, I did mention in, in my uh, talk that we're looking at the notion of translation here between forms, uh, between the oral and the written. And much work has been done in recent times. I would uh, refer you, for example, to the work of Stephen Mueke, uh, who has done a lot of transcriptions of oral narratives uh, of Aboriginal people but not in a form that takes away the performative quality of, uh, you know, oral storytelling. The moment you are, uh, you know, an oral history, in many ways, the moment it is translated into print, you are taking away the performative quality of that, right? The oral is also performative. Uh, but it is necessary, I think, when we translate it into print to develop styles of, uh, transcription styles of rendering as it were uh, into the written that would allow for some if not all of that performative quality of the teller of the story of the life story or the memoir um, to, to uh, you know be retained and that has been done this is a topic that would take much longer time to really uh, sort of build on but I would refer you to the work of Stephen Mueke, that's the person that comes to mind. Um, many others in Australia who are um, not using traditional uh, you know, methods of, of you know, writing up field notes in the way in which anthropologists do when they are talking to people about their lives, 
but using a more creative medium, so fictal criticism, for example, uh, or or even arranging the words on a page so that it's more uh, like like um, you know a, a, a poetic expression, keeping in parentheses everything that the person is uh, saying in terms of non-verbal expression, you know, uh, clearing their throat, an aside to a friend, maybe smoking a cigarette and thinking about something before they again, you know, recall. So all of those are kept within parentheses in the printed text as well. So, you know, that translation from the oral to the written uh, is, is uh, sh shall we say, there is less erasure than there would have been in earlier decades now, thanks to these new, new forms of uh, translation, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, I would also like to reflect upon an observation uh, which is uh, uh, made by uh, Dr. Dopa Mudradas, who previously asked for a question to Shutapa Ma'am. Uh, she mentions that uh, she is reminded of the broken identities and endangered ethos and the oral transmission of myths in the writings of Pensula Ao or Ernest Ernestine Kaya and the others. Uh, I really, and she really appreciates uh, your clarification of the concept of testimonials. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that India and Australia, uh, I mean, uh, she's obviously referring to writers from Nagaland, but it's not just about writers from Nagaland. I think um, indigenous communities, Adivasi communities all over India have a problem similar to that of the uh, people, indigenous people of Australia is that unlike Canada or New Zealand where treaties were signed between the uh, you know the settlers or colonizers and the indigenous people there were no treaties signed between uh, you know the Adivasi people the tribal people of, of uh, you know the Northeast as such or uh, you know in Australia which means there's no legal standing from which they, they can argue for their land rights you know that only in um, recent years the Forest uh, Act uh, has, has allowed for tribal communities in India to fight against corporations that are trying to take over their land. For example, the Niamgiri Hills in Orissa where, as you know, the Vedanta uh, Bauxite Mining Corporation tried to take over land, but the local uh, Adivasi people fought back and they were able uh, to, to stop that exploitation of their land. So, you know, it's, it's a much more difficult process, I think, in India and Australia because there is no prior treaty or agreement between the state and those who we could call the First Nations, the people who have prior claim to these territories. Thank you so much, Professor Dev. Uh, now I would ask Omorish to ask yes, question from your group. Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, uh, my first question is for Shutava ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have a question uh, from uh, Plavon Bhuya uh, from the PhD College Assam. Uh, with the professor, he's asked that uh, how far diaries, memories and autobiographies help to reconstruct women history uh, in the post-colonial era? That is the question. Uh, this is for Chutava uh, Man, the first question. Yes, these are very important uh, materials because, uh, you know, when uh, we start uh, to uh, start to write women history as a, as a discipline, we uh, we have nothing in our hands, only oral traditions and only diaries, private archives and their uh, own collections. So, uh, to reconstruct history, to give it a shape, to give women's history a shape, these materials are very important. They are very essential. I fully agree with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. What is your next question, please? Yes, ma'am. My next question is for uh, Nilanjana, ma'am. 
Uh, Ma'am, we have a question from Farul Soni. Uh, she is a uh, research scholar from Kurukshetra University. She asked how can the Aboriginal identities be seen uh, from the post-colonial point of view? The both, uh, she is asking that. How can the Aboriginal identities be seen from the post-colonial point of view? Okay, Th thank you, Farul. Uh, uh, it's, I think, a question that has uh, plagued po students of post-colonial literature for a very long time because we so easily uh, try to assimilate Aboriginal, Adivasi and Dalit identities within the term post-colonial, right? Um, but I think that we need to be a little careful here. And Parul, I would ask you to read a wonderful uh, essay called Godzilla versus Postcolonial by the Canadian First Nations writer Thomas King, which would give you, uh, uh, and, and also the song is very short by uh, Lewis Owens, uh, both uh, Native American writers, in which they talk about why they are not happy with being brought under the term postcolonial. Because you see, for indigenous communities, whose lands, uh, from, uh, you know, they were dispossessed of their lands, colonized, and in most cases around the world, because of systematic genocide um, and, and uh, deliberate underdevelopment by the colonizing forces, their numbers were reduced to a point where they cannot physically throw out the colonizer from their traditional territories. It is impossible, right? So post-colonial then becomes an aspirational term. Right? Um, it's an aspirational term and so, you know, when, when you say, uh, you know, that Native American literature or Adivasi literature or Aboriginal literature or Maori literature is post-colonial, I think that uh, indigenous people around the world might actually say that no, there are certain similarities in terms of, you know, uh, tropes of resistance tropes uh, uh, that that deal with you know issues of you know cultural loss uh, the the need to deal with cultural change in the wake of colonization those are similarities uh, but at the same time uh, it, you know physical decolonization is not possible in the case of most indigenous peoples and um, they develop particularly thomas king who i referred you to uh, tries to develop alternative terms that could be used to describe the different kinds of indigenous writing or aboriginal writing that exist instead of post-colonial literature, right? You might say that aboriginal literature or indigenous literature frays the margins of post-colonial or post-colonial literature. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Thib. Uh, now, uh, I would ask Roger to ask the questions from Group 4. Roger, are you ready with your questions? Yes. Please. Thank you, Mohamed. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank both the speakers uh, for giving us an enduring talk and making this uh, webinar a lively one. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one for, uh, the first one is for Superbob Ma'am. Uh, this has again been asked by Parul Sumi. Uh, yeah, Parul wants to know that since uh, memoirs and uh, diaries are written from personal experiences, how far does it influence in the formation of collective or identity consciousness of a clan or a group uh, uh, in, the, in regards to cultural history? Again, I have to repeat the same thing because. Yes, you have listened to. Yes, no, no. See, we have taken this question. No, no, no. It's, it's all right. Thank you for the question. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to. Uh, researchers should collect uh, different private diaries, memoirs, and he has to compare those diaries, memoirs, and Within a particular time frame, he has to compare it. So, if this can be done, then the truth will automatically come. In this way, we can get the real history, true history. 
Only one dialy will not do. We have to collect the other uh, sources. Uh, we have to go to the uh, private archive uh, and we have to collect many other sources to, so that we can compare the whole thing. Otherwise, you cannot get the uh, pure history from it. But this is also important because other, uh, if we do not, uh, if we rather ignore oral history, then we are totally ignoring the history of a, uh, of a part of a, uh, of a society. So it cannot be uh, all that we are giving the, we are uh, reflecting the total history. In terms of total history, oral history uh, should be uh, taken into consideration and for oral history, we have to go through we have to access the private archives as well. And in private archives, we have to uh, collect uh, materials we can get and uh, we have to compare all those materials so that we can uh, get a clear picture, the true history from it, out of it. That should be the process. It's a long process, I think. It, it will take more uh, years and after years to get the true history. It cannot be done in one day, one or two days. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. Uh, what is uh, your question for this uh, day? Uh, the question is for Nalaja, uh, ma'am. Uh, it has been asked by Nandini Pradeep. Uh, she is from EFLU. Uh, he wants to know that since uh, testimonial literatures and oral histories are largely included in academics, how far has it been helpful in the issues and aspects you have been discussing about? Um, I'm not getting the thrust of her question. Is she saying that in what way has the inclusion of uh, these kinds of uh, texts? Literatures and oral histories uh, which has been largely used in academics, so uh, she wants to know how far has it been helpful in highlighting the issues and aspects that you are you were talking about. Uh, see, there is this process by which certain texts get to be included in university syllabi around the world, and here I'm referring not just to uh, you know. Aboriginal texts, but from texts from marginalized communities, such as you know Dalit writing uh, or or uh, you know uh, queer writing as well. But there's a certain uh, you know select number of texts that get included in university syllabi, and that forms a little sort of you know niche canon, uh, you might say, of its own. And you have people then writing papers at seminars on those. And perhaps, yes, dissemination happens through the fact that some of these texts are included within university syllabi. Um, but on the other hand, if you think of uh, you know, how it actually translates into uh, any kind of change at the grassroots level for these communities in terms of you know, it translating into uh, you know, greater uh, mobilization uh, amongst civil society for their, uh, you know, the, the improvement in socio-economic conditions or uh, more human rights, civil rights, that's debatable because I think one of the things that I never tire of seeing is that we in academia seem to um, imagine that we have a great impact by studying certain texts in the classroom, we are somehow impacting the world in a big way. But uh, in our little ivory tower of the university, uh, I think we are often, very often just preaching to the converted, you know. Uh, we are very often either talking to a liberal or radical students and they are talking to us. And uh, how much that translates into actual change for you know, tribal or Adivasi communities in real life, I, I really have a big question mark on that. Okay, thank you for responding. Thank you so much, Dr. Dev. Uh, now I would uh, ask Joydeep to please uh, 
a policy that against the parents' wishes, often Aboriginal children would be sent out to white foster homes. So, you know, this idea of assimilation. In the case of, of India, I think, we need to distinguish uh, the case of the Northeast, uh, Northeastern states, I think, from, let's say, uh, you know, Eastern and Central India, uh, because the case uh, in terms of the histories are very different. Um, I think that indigenous communities in India have had to face outside of the Northeast a huge onslaught in terms of you know corporations as well as the state uh, interfering with their lives. Uh, a prime example of which is the Narmada Sardar Sarovar project, where, as you well know, you know, eighteen thousand villages, mostly with the tribal population. Uh, are today literally struggling for physical survival, right? So um, uh, the, the state's interference outside of the Northeast, the Northeast is a different story. I mean, there are questions of sovereignty, questions of, uh, you know, uh, the, all of these acts, the ASPA and so on. Uh, it's, it, again, it would take a long time to really you know, go into this. Suffice it to say, I think that um, it's not so easy to do a kind of sweeping comparison between the two countries. Within each of these countries, there are also regional specificities. There are also, uh, you know, different communities or peoples have engaged with, uh, you know, the state in different ways, have resisted in different ways, and we need to take it community by community. You know, we should not homogenize uh, even in our comparisons. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Dev, for such wonderful explanations. Uh, we are running out of time, but we are flooded with questions, and I wish I could, I could, you know, <laughs> uh, read out the kind of comments and observations that have come. All of appreciation is, you know, just just going through. Uh, we can max take two questions more. We are really sorry that we cannot accommodate any any other questions because of. Time, you have to bear with us. So, two more questions, please, quickly. Yes, ma'am, can I come in? Yes, please. Yes, uh, I have a question for Sutama, ma'am. Uh, 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 Sudipta Dosto, uh, uh, he's a uh, postgraduate student from West Bengal State University. Uh, he is asked that linguistic peculiarity from Different religions and ethnic groups of Bengal merge in the Baul culture. Uh, what are the possibilities of recreating linguistic history from this? What are the possibilities of recreating linguistic history from this? That is the question. Actually, Baul is an oral tradition. I've told that. Uh, for that, we have to uh, call it more and, and uh, the Baul religion is based on their mystic songs. The whole philosophy is uh, laid within the songs, within their mystic songs. So we have to collect this and we have to compare this with, uh, with different philosophy, Marge, uh, the merger of different philosophies. Uh, can be seen in the Baul tradition, in the Baul oral tradition. So we have to uh, compare this to make a rich linguistic tradition out of that. It needs many uh, research, more research. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Oritro, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I have a question for Professor Nilanjana Dev. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. The question is from Mahesh Chandra Das, Senior Lecturer, Department of English, PKAIET, Bargar, Odisha. Uh, his question is, uh, to what extent has life writing in course influenced the lives of Aboriginals in Black Australia? Black Australia is again in double quotes. Okay. Um, how has life writing by Aboriginals influenced the lives of Blacks? Uh, I think a small hint was given there in um, the anecdote I told you about uh, how 
uh, you know, King Scott was approached by members of the Nyungar community and they said, you know, stop writing all these fancy novels in English like Salman Rushdie does and write something that is meant for us. And I think that uh, increasingly uh, amongst the original writers, the sense that they are not just spokespersons for the community, but they are also accountable to their own community, that they must, in a sense, tell these stories in a language that the community can understand. Um, and therefore, uh, we do have a lot of writers, uh, you know, actually going on tour, for example, amongst remote or rural areas to read out uh, portions from, you know, what they have written. Uh, a lot of Aboriginal life writing has also, I think, brought in a sense, a very strong sense of, you know, community self-esteem because there are now actually several very prestigious awards that are there in Australia specifically for uh, Aboriginal writers. And so um, this the sense that, you know, their work is being recognized and that Indigenous writing has developed an identity of its own, uh, you know, beyond just, you know, uh, sort of, you know, the interest of anthropologists, it is now acknowledged as, as you know, an important body of uh, writing in Australia. That sense of community self-esteem, and above all, I think, uh, how has it affected people's lives? Let me give you the example of, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's several anthologies, not not life writing only, but also you know forms of self-expression, um, including artwork. Because remember that. It's not just about the written word. These are often communities more comfortable with the oral tradition. So a lot of music, uh, you know, uh, contemporary music that is being created, rap, even uh, artwork, certainly a lot of theater. And a lot of it is, in fact, aimed not as it was in the 60s, even at the normative white audience. It is aimed at the community itself. And I think that is the most important thing that life writing has done for uh, the Aboriginal community. Thank you so much, Dr. Thep. I'm so sorry that we have to close the session. Otherwise, I presume it could go on for hours. The way questions are coming in even now, but you know, there's uh, we have our own limitations, the data and everything involved. Uh, I'm sure that. We will again meet in some other, you know, webinar very, very soon. That and it has a beautiful confluence of, you know, academicians and the scholars and students from all parts of the country. So it's, it's really so heartening that you have been so, you know, so uh, spontaneous to be a part of this webinar. I thank you all and my heartfelt gratitude to both the speakers today. I, I think I was quite correctly prophetic when I said that after these two after these two lectures our webinar will attain new heights and yes I, I'm sure it is now. All right, so thank you. Mohade, thank you so much. Sorry yes, to interrupt. Yes, okay. Professor Professor Josie has remarked something. I think that's very important and that's for Professor Dev also. Okay, should, I, should I read that? Yes okay please do it. Okay. Ma'am uh, Professor Josie has written in the chat box uh, the first time I heard term Aborigin was when Yvonne Gulagong, later Kole, of Australia owned the Wimbledon Singles Crown in 1971. I wish to know if the plight of Aborigines has been highlighted in the Australian cinema. Interrogation. It has, it has. A lot, a lot um, has. Um, you could look at this wonderful movie called Follow the Rabbit Proof Fence which tells the story of how from the Moor River settlement that I was talking about, three Aboriginal girls escaped and walked hundreds of kilometers to, you know, reach their homes from which they had been stolen. So, you know, not just that, there are many stories now, uh, not just films made by white Australians, but films made by uh, black Australians, by Aboriginal people themselves. Just like in India, we are seeing the emergence of Dalit cinema is a very vibrant uh, you know, new cinema. Similarly, in Australia also we are seeing the emergence of, uh, you know, uh, cinema as well as, you know, the use of the electronic media itself because cinema requires big budget 
and budget is a constraint for many of the economically backward uh, aboriginal communities but they are using the internet very well very effectively in fact bypassing censorship bypassing state control um, and and just like this webinar uh, you know has has reached out to many more people than a physical seminar could have reached out today aboriginal people are reaching out to much bigger audiences than than they have in the past they are fighting back they are talking back and they are singing their own songs yeah mohadi mohadi one yes, more one more thing there is one chat also from professor joshi i think that's very uh, encouraging for us should i read that if you allow yes, me yes please do okay okay uh, am i audible enough because it's a, because it's our appreciation so i just need to ask am i audible enough comment yes please okay no praise can be too high for the team team of derosio memorial college for organizing such an exhaustive webinar two days of intellectual brainstorming fortunate to be a part of the deliberations looking forward to some more such exercises in future thank you sir it's a really yes, encouraging for us we are also looking thank forward you, thank you thank you so so much we are really really obliged thank you okay our principal sir has also joined us that's very kind of him uh, we are almost on the verge of closing our session uh, before before uh, uh, asking uh, for the vote of the i would request all the participants to subscribe to our youtube channel so that you can you know view such academic contents in in uh, in near future also and regarding the feedback form and the certificates immediately after the webinar is over you will get your feedback forms via emails where after you uh, submit the forms and you do submit it by 2 hours that means it's 5 o'clock now so by 7 o'clock please submit the forms and immediately after that you will get your answer all right i hope i have answered the query because continuously this query was coming in the whatsapp messages i i saw so uh so as from now onwards in that spam please fill up the form and you know submit it and the certificates will be there in your mail okay thank you so much lots of love and best wishes and warm regards to all the participants and thank you so much all the resource persons thank you for your kind consent and you know that meaningful lectures which have you know enlightened us and illuminated us thank you so much okay over to you anjana i would i would request dr anjana chattopadhyay my co-organizer of this webinar to deliver the vote of thanks thank you moa um as the sun is preparing to move behind the horizon we have reached the time when we have to draw curtains on this two days national webinar we are aware that there is a large scope of improvement for which your feedback is really vital for us we are grateful to our honorable vice chancellor of west bengal state university professor bashup choudhury for his valuable time and his inaugural speech which i think has left us enriched in various aspects we are grateful to our respected president governing body and deputy mayor of bidhanagar municipal corporation sri tapos chatterjee for his great support and guidance to this institution i would like to thank dr dibendu talapatro our principal dirujio memorial college for his enthusiasm support and encouragement which goes a long way to boost up our confidence i thank iqse for the financial support and in this context i would like to mention the name of dr choitali mukherji iqse coordinator for her mental support and encouragement i would like to thank our respected speakers dr ishmit kaur choudhury of central university of gujarat and professor anil kumar joshi of kumayun university of uttarakhand dr shutapa sengupta of kolyan university and dr nilanjana dev of jadavpur university for their wonderful discourse which definitely have broadened our spectrum of knowledge we are grateful to all faculty members of different universities colleges institutions scholars and students for their overwhelming participations and interaction i would like to acknowledge the contribution of dr obhi kray our librarian and sri orijit banerjee faculty of english for their technical support and without their help it would not have been possible for us to this academic meet i would like to mention the name of sri anirban goshu roy choudhury of journalism and mass communication department for his creative ideas which you will visualize 
in the brochure and in the certificate which we will receive later on. I would like to thank my co-organizing secretaries, Dr. Moa Bhumi, Head of the Department of English, and Sri Rajat Tamang, Department of History, for their relentless hard work. I would like to thank Dr. Shoykot Mondal, Joint Convener of Seminar Program Committee, for his valuable advice from time to time. Besides, I would like to mention the names of faculty members of English departments, Sri Joydeep Shen, Srimati Riya Munshi, Sri Aritra Banerjee, and Sri Ambori Shupadhyay, and faculty members of history departments, Srimati Krishna Deppal, Sri Partho Shaha, and Sri Mihir Mondol, who have helped us in all possible ways. We are grateful to all faculty members of different departments of our college for their unified approach in making the webinar a success. We cannot forget the contributions of non-teaching staffs for their constant support in all our activities. Last but not the least, we are indeed happy to have the students of history and English departments for their active participation. We thank the members of Students' Union for their supportive role in all our activities. Before we depart, I wish you all of you have enriched yourself from the webinar and would like your similar support in our future ventures. All the best. Once again, thank you all and hope you will have an enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Stay good, stay safe. Goodbye. And see you soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.